Welcome back everyone to the DeFi course. I'm Andrew and in this lecture we are going to be talking about decentralized identities and their role in DeFi. Decentralized identity is a fairly uh, broad and expansive topic um, and in this lecture we're going to focus on three main aspects of decentralized identity. To start with, we're going to talk about uh, a fairly practical role that decentralized identity will play uh, in DeFi applications, which is the need to link in external accounts like Twitter accounts or email addresses um, and incorporate them into the uh, function of some smart contract or DeFi application. We're going to talk about the attestation model, which is a high-level framework for understanding the roles and processes that are involved. We'll talk a bit about uh, decentralized identifiers and what it means to pick a good string name to identify a person or an account. And we'll talk about a technical method that's based on zero-knowledge proofs or ZK snarks. And um, that, that's really important for providing security guarantees like privacy uh, in this context. Uh, and those are called anonymous credentials. Uh, the second facet is we'll talk about real names and authoritative identities like state government IDs, uh, what you think of as ordinary real name identities that you use in the, the normal traditional world. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the regulations that DeFi companies or service providers uh, might need to uh, uh, use authoritative identities to comply with. And we'll talk about a, a research project called Candid, which is a technique based on uh, technology like cryptography and zero knowledge proofs that provides a way to bootstrap an anonymous credential from uh, one of these old legacy systems that provides authoritative identities. Um, finally, we'll talk about some alternatives that I think of are important for the future of DeFi, uh, which are alternative forms of identity that don't rely as much on authorities like uh, centralized issuers or state governments to issue IDs, but instead provide some alternative ways to carry out some of the desired uh, uh, functionality that IDs play. Um, and we'll look at two ideas in particular. One is called webs of trust and another is called proofs of personhood. And we'll talk about those uh, alternatives later on. To start with, we're going to talk about the problem of linking external accounts into a DeFi or smart contract application. The simplest example uh, that I can think of where this would occur, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen examples of this before in the cryptocurrency world, is the idea of making an airdrop of some newly created tokens. And the goal is that anyone with a Twitter account is able to go and claim some allocation of this new token that's been created. Uh, so here we have Alice, her Twitter account is alice to go and what she wants to be able to do is to say to this uh, smart contract or decentralized application, I have the Twitter account, my Twitter account's Alice to go, so go ahead and give me my, my airdropped portion of tokens. Now the question is, how will we go about implementing this? And um, maybe you can think of some ways that you might do it. There's a couple um, fairly straightforward ones that come to mind. I bet that you can uh, guess or come up with uh, uh, what a solution would be. I think the simplest one is to have Alice generate a secret key, an Ethereum account, in this case, if she doesn't already have one. And what she would do is log into Twitter and change her profile so that her profile says what her Ethereum address is. So she's logged into the Twitter account. She's set her profile to indicate that her address is uh, what she's logged into and set it to. She has the private key to that account. And then when she uh, asks this service to go and send her um, to send her her allocation of the airdrop token, well, uh, the backer, the developers of the token, if they're going to assign the tokens this way, they could be the relying party. They would access Alice's Twitter account, see Alice's profile, see the address that she's indicating there. And that tells them what address they should uh, allocate the portion of the new tokens to. You might spot the potential also to use an oracle here instead. Uh, if we didn't want to have the developers, you know, a centralized party in the middle, go and access tw Alice's Twitter account to see which address she's claiming, um, an oracle could be used instead. An oracle would sit in between the smart contract uh, that's issuing the token and the, the oracle would fetch 
Twitter profiles to see which Ethereum addresses are in there, and if so, allocate a portion to that address. Um, besides this airdrop example, there's several others. Um, besides airdrop, something fairly closely related is the idea of tipping. This is where you want to send a cryptocurrency payment to the owner of a Twitter account or an Instagram account, any website. And there are the challenges that they have this account, that's who you want to send it to, but they don't already have a cryptocurrency address linked to their account. If you could, you would just use that. But the idea of tipping is that you should be able to uh, send them and make available uh, uh, this portion of money that as soon as they can prove that they've created an address and associated it with that account, they'll be able to claim that money that was set aside to them. And this requires linking the external account into the smart contract context in some way. Another fundamental uh, reason why you would want to link an external account is in order to make use of reputation as a source of extra collateral. So we have seen so far that um, DeFi derivatives instruments typically require over collateralization uh, and that can be expensive. You have to often put in a security deposit that's larger than uh, whatever token trade you want to deal with. Uh, if you're able to link in um, some other account that already has a reputation, then maybe you could use that reputation as a kind of collateral. The idea is that if you promise to do something and you don't do it, then that can follow you back and um, your followers on Instagram would be angry with you that you didn't do what you promised to do in a smart contract setting. So that's using reputation as an extra source of collateral. Another reason might be to provide uh, a simpler single sign-on service. Um, you could sign on to a system, a, a DeFi system, or a smart contract just using your blockchain address directly, but maybe more convenient for users to be able to use their existing accounts. And for some features like a dashboard or a read-only service, something where you're not supposed to be accessing your hot wallet private keys at the time, it might be reasonable to log in with um, an external account instead. Another reason is if you simply want to avoid farmers or botnets or spammers from signing up with thousands of accounts and basically using up all of your airdrop by signing up with, with so many different accounts. Uh, lots of social media systems like Twitter and Instagram already do their best to make sure that uh, spammers can't sign up with an infinite number of accounts. And so by using some existing external account, you have the potential to um, make use of whatever anti-spam uh, measures that external account provides. And a final rationale for linking external accounts into the smart contract setting is to provide some alternate way of recovering lost keys. Key management is difficult. Users lose keys all the time. Uh, most issuers of accounts provide some kind of backup method, whether it is calling you on the phone, whether there's an office that you can show up to in person, or whether you just have a recovery account and they'll send the recovery account. You might have to call up their tech support line and really convince them that, that you're the rightful owner of the account. Uh, but if they provide alternate ways of getting into your account, even if you've lost all of your keys, lost your devices, uh, well, having some way that you can access a smart contract resource based on your control of an external account, that could provide some useful alternate way to recover that account. The final uh, reason why you would want to link in external accounts uh, that I'll mention here is the idea of one person, one vote as a kind of fairness principle. Uh, in DeFi, we're often interested in decision making in groups and uh, decision making for the uh, to determine what a DAO or some uh, mechanism is going to do based on collecting votes of the users who are using the system or the stakeholders who have uh, put down deposits into that system. Uh, the natural way to do that is to say one dollar, one vote. The more tokens you've put into the system, the more influence you have. But it's typically considered more fair to have uh, one person, one vote. This gives you know equal contribution or equal influence in the decision making even to users who uh, haven't put in as many tokens. And if you wanted to achieve this, then it's not enough just to count the number of Ethereum accounts because anyone can create as many Ethereum accounts as they want. Uh, but on the other hand, if you can use 
uh, an account on some other system that does make an effort to ensure that people can only sign up uh, one account per person, then by linking in those accounts, that can be a way that you can ensure this one person, one vote. So we'll go over these uh, application ideas uh, in more detail uh, throughout the rest of the lecture. So before getting too much further into the interesting technical and security questions here, I want to introduce just some common terminology that we'll use throughout this lecture. So these are the roles that are involved in an attestation model. The idea of the attestation model is that there's a subject that's typically a user. Uh, there's an issuer who is the identity provider or the account provider. Um, there's some kind of authority for the sake of this uh, uh, use case. And by an attestation, what it means is they're going to say something about the subject. The issuer is going to say something about the subject. The relying party is someone who is going to listen to the issuer, receive this attestation, and learn something about the subject before interacting with them. So to go back to the simple example of an airdrop, uh, but just to assign it these terms, uh, in this example, Alice is the subject, and the relying party is going to be the new token application the smart contract or the developers behind it, depending on how that would work. And the issuer in this case is going to be Twitter. They're the ones who provide the Twitter account. And the relying party, the DAP issuer, the DAP smart contract, this new token that's, that's conducting the airdrop, they're going to rely on the claim of the issuer that says, this is the uh, account Alice to go. This is Alice's real name is what's written in this case. And this is the Ethereum address that's pasted in the profile. Now, the way that this um, setting worked, I'll draw your attention to one aspect and then ask the question, are there any problems that you can think of with this or ways to, to uh, uh, do better? And what I'll draw your attention to as a hint for answering this question is, notice that there are two places of communication with the uh, creators of this token or the smart contract itself. They interact with Alice. Alice says, please sign me up. This is my Twitter account. I'm ready to receive my airdrop. Uh, but they also receive communication directly from the issuer, Twitter in this case. So with that as the preface, can you think of any problems with this? Well, the main problem that I can think of is one of privacy. Putting your Ethereum address in your Twitter profile to sign up for an airdrop of this kind is great, but this would reveal your intent to participate in this airdrop to Twitter, and it would reveal your Ethereum address um, associated with your Twitter account. It would reveal this publicly because everyone can see your, your public Twitter profile. Um, so this would be really bad for privacy. So let's look at another example that you're probably familiar with. This is using an ordinary uh, state government issued ID card with your age on it as a way of entering a bar. So a bar in the US anyway is required not to allow anyone to enter who's not of a certain age. And the way that this works in practice of course is that you get an identity card that is produced by the issuer, some authority in your area. They issue you a document called a credential uh, that has your identifying information on it, like your photo, your year of birth. And it has a bunch of tamper-proof features. It's supposed to be difficult to make a fake ID card that passes inspection. And what you can do is show your ID card to this bar upon entering it. All they do is check that you're of an adequate age and then let you leave. Now, what's nice about this is that unlike in the Twitter airdrop scenario, there's no communication between the issuer and the bar. Uh, the issuer never learns, you know, the Department of Motor Vehicles never learns which bars you go to because they're not involved in the transaction of you presenting your credential, your identity document to the bar. Uh, similarly, they can't even uh, prevent you from going to the bar if they wanted to. They can't like shut off their, their service and prevent you from showing your ID to the bar. So in some ways, this is um, a lot better in terms of privacy. The act of showing it to the bar reveals your identity to the bar. And we'll look at how to do better than that later on. Um, but it doesn't reveal which locations you went to, um, to the issuer. So this model is even better for privacy in some regards than the um, 
uh, Twitter airdrop. And we're going to look at a couple of more high-tech alternatives in a moment. But first, let's recap and just uh, discuss some questions that we can ask about any uh, attestation model protocol. So first of all, we would look at privacy. What does the issuer learn about the interactions between the subject and the relying party? We also care about availability. Is the issuer needed to sign off on this interaction between the subject and the relying party? We'll also be interested in looking at issues like revocation. Does the issuer have the ability to cancel the ID card? Does the subject even have the ability to cancel it if they want to? Um, and finally, we'll look at the you know, meaning of the attestation. Does it carry more information like the subject's address, their real name, their prior names, their transaction history. In principle, it could be anything. And um, is the issuer guaranteeing anything about this, like that it's an accurate description of your address? These are all issues by which some of the schemes we'll look at will differ.